thank you. Let's get right to it. Uh, the obsidian collection. The term obsidian comes from a volcanic rock. It's a dark glass that's formed when uh, lava and dirt, certain explosions, all of that come about. So there are lots of uh, obsidian around Hawaii and other places where there are volcanoes. I love the name because I think that's what black culture is. Beautiful, black, shiny, formed from high pressure, heat, etc. And that's what we're doing, the Obsidian Collection. We're collecting the black archives. But more than just that, we're digitizing them and making them available for younger generations. And as I started the project, just a little bit over three years ago, we were asked, why, why are you doing that? There's already archive groups that are collecting history. The universities are collecting it. And uh, we got that big, beautiful new uh, black Smithsonian in DC. So why do you need to form the Obsidian Collection? And I think I can best communicate that in telling you about my love of football. Now, I know it's going gonna, it's gonna to work its way back around. But I love football. I love Chicago Bears football. And I can tell you from when I was five to seven years old, I was, my dad's friends would come over. We had a giant floor model TV. And they would let me get the beer. And they would let me empty the ashtrays. Now, this is the late 60s, early 70s. So beer cans were made of like what I would think was solid titanium steel. And the ashtrays were these huge ceramic platters. So my responsibility was important. I remember the screens being green. There being white lines on the screen. People would crash into each other. And then my father and his friends would either cheer or jeer. And it was football. And I love football. Now fast forward, I started seeing football throughout my life. And I know how football works. The X's and the O's line up. Then they crash into each other. And then somebody throws in a yellow towel. And then people stand around like this. And then they wait. And then the guys in the stripes come out and do some things. And then they either say this way or they say that way. And then you cheer or jeer. Now, I've been watching football my whole life. I would argue with you that I love football, just like any other American. And I love the Chicago Bears. I'm a native Chicagoan. But imagine if I was the curator of the Chicago Bears. I would put together an exhibit, and it would be all of the collisions, right? Because that's what they kind of do. They run into each other a lot. They line up, and then they run into each other. And then, they, then somebody throws the towel. I, I, I've seen it. So <laughs> what I would do is I would have an exhibit of all the collisions, and then I would have another exhibit of the towels, because they went from like a mustard, and then they started being more yellow. I do remember that. And then I know in some of the bigger games, they pour containers of water on each other at the end of big wins. I do know that, too. <laughs> now, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but that happens in football. And I love football. So one of my exhibits is going to be all the coolers of water dunking on people, because that's football to me. And I love football. Now, somebody who actually likes football would go to my exhibit, and inside of 15 seconds, they would go, what is this? <laughs> and this isn't football. There are layers to football. And there's a whole ecosystem and culture around football. And this isn't football. And that's what happens with a lot of African Americans that walk into an exhibit and go, what, what is this? It's people who just focus on the collisions. So you just hear picket, protest, slave, struggle. And it's like, um, look, there are layers to this thing. This isn't the sum total of the black experience. And just like me with football, and this is true, because that is my understanding of football, I would say, well, explain football to me. And then people who know football are like, look, 
you just don't know football and you can't be in charge of it. It's, not, it's okay that you think you love it or whatever your association is with it. That's not the sum total of football. And I remember my senior year of college, the Bears went to the Super Bowl and I watched it with everybody. And again, they lined up. I don't know what the problem is, because that's what happened. They lined up, there was a snap, somebody ran this way, somebody they ran into each other, somebody threw in a towel. This is, what, this is what I see, and I love it, but I loved everything around it. I'm football adjacent. I'm not, I don't, I should not be in charge of telling the story of football. So it was then when one of my friends said, after, they, after we won, I know we won, I do know that, that we won that Super Bowl. The, um, one of my friends said, who do you think is gonna be the MVP? I didn't know what an MVP was. But everybody burst into conversation. And they started discussing these plays and these little nuances and all of this other stuff. And that's when I realized I don't know what they're talking about. And that's how black culture is. You can be adjacent and you can love it, but there's a lot of layers to it. And it's important that there be an independent, freestanding organization run by black people to curate that story because we can walk into an exhibit and go, I get it, it's a protest, struggle, it's a slave, it's a lynching. It's like, it's like that's all that's there. So it's important for us to take the narrative back and that's what the Obsidian Collection is doing. So we started with the Chicago Defender. Now, many people know, and I don't wanna preach to the choir, but the Chicago Defender started in 1904 and it's essential to black history because as we were freed as slaves, everybody needed to know, people wanted to start migrating away. And the Chicago Defender was different from other newspapers and they took the initiative to actually start getting these newspapers down south. So they partnered with the Pullman Porters and the Pullman Porters were, in a way to make extra money, they were distributing and selling the papers. When in down south, it was kind of frowned upon for black people to actually even read, let alone get the scoop on where to go. So the Chicago Defender actually helped show black Americans what was going on in the rest of the states, where they should go, where safe passage was, what to dress like when you come up north, what to wear, all of those good things came through the Chicago Defender. And um, the Chicago Defender had sold the family, the original family from 1904, sold the paper in about 2007. The theory was that all of the images were taken by the family and then some were given to the library, some to Getty, et cetera, and there weren't that many images left. So when we came there, we thought there were gonna be 10,000 images and we found actually 250,000 images in this one room. And what happened to me was you can't see 250,000 images of yourself and ever be the same, right? So it was like being bit by a radioactive spider we said, we gotta get this information out. And, and I've learned through my own child that young people get everything through the smartphone. So when I was telling my son about some of the stories and some of the things we found, he would go right to his smartphone and say, well, that's not in here. And, you know, are you spelling it right? You know? And I remember, in my own naivete, I thought, when the internet was invented, that everything was automatically on the internet. Like, well, now it's on the internet now through some kind of magic. What I came to learn was we weren't digitizing the black newspapers. The black photojournalists weren't getting, there just weren't specific platforms to get the information out there so that younger and future generations can immediately access it. So that's one of the things we, started with the Chicago, the Chicago Defender was our first effort, and now we have uh, a lot of black newspapers in the queue to share their images so we can get them out so that everybody can see them and tell fabulous new stories. So, what John mentioned, uh, we, we have a wonderful partnership. Our first immediate platform is through uh, Google Arts and Culture, who we met through the Black Googler Network. And we started by just putting up some images. Now, 
these are just three of a quarter of a million. And so, you know, I narrowed it down. You're welcome. And, uh, but the, the first image I like a lot because it's just one of the secretaries when the Chicago Defender moved their offices into the South Loop of Chicago. That's an important play. That story is on uh, the Google Arts and Culture Obsidian page. And it's a series of images. But just being able to accomplish a feat like that back in those days, and then there were printers in the basement and all of those other feats, those are, those are the kind of plays that we would discuss amongst ourselves. That's the kind of information that would, would that's the narrative of how we see ourselves. Um, Aside from just the newspapers and the photographers, we've got small community archives joining us. And so the other picture, the opposite one, is of Fred Hutchinson with a plane. A wonderful story of this guy who wanted to fly planes, but as a, a black man in the early 1920s, that was a non-starter. But his family was a family of means, so his father bought him an airplane. And so he learned how to fly by starting a plane getting in it and flying it and landing you know that he that happened and uh and that that was and that was a small plane a single engine plane but he wanted to learn how to fly the commercial airplane so he moved to canada and he joined the royal canadian air force where he learned then he eventually moved to haiti and opened up a black flight school but by then we were entering world war ii and america had decided we're going to need some black pilots so he actually became a flight instructor for the Tuskegee Airmen. So that story is from Shorefront and Legacy archives. They've been collecting the history of the black people who lived on the Gold Coast in the 1900s. That's a story that doesn't get told, but it was a lot of them. And that was, you know, what, 120 years ago. But we were there, too. So Shorefront has a great archive, and now the Obsidian platform, they've joined us, and we'll be able to get those stories to the world. The one in the middle is just one of my favorite photos because it's just black boy joy. I raised a black son in, in Chicago, and, and the kids have fun. But that's not the narrative that's in the mainstream. But my life was fun. My son's life was fun. If he says it's not, he's lying. <laughs> it was amazing. I was an awesome parent. But <laughs> those, we've got a ton of images like that. This is one of my favorite, and this is, helps me communicate that we're not, I'm not doing this alone, because I'm not an archivist. They will let you know that, that uh, that's a postgraduate degree industry. I am not an archivist. I am not a historian. They will let you know that, too. Uh, and that's a PhD process. So what I am is a storyteller. But I've aligned us with experts, and we're creating new experts. This picture, the man with the hat, is Joe Lewis. He's a famous boxer. And I knew he was a boxer because when I was a kid, we drank Joe Lewis milk. And on the cover, he was posing like this, and he had on boxing gloves. So I knew he was a boxer. I didn't know he was one of the most famous boxers ever, blah, 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 but that's Joe Lewis. The guy in the middle, Judge Duke Slater. Duke is the first African-American lineman to play in the NFL. And that story doesn't get that much coverage. I will spare you, in, in long and short, that in the NFL in 1926, he was, he's got one of the best records. It was just broken recently by a Chicago Bear. But um, the NFL let five black people play in 1926. Then they hokey pokeyed it back and said, no, no black players. So he, it went down, it was five, then it went down to zero. So he was the first head coach and formed the Chicago Negro All-Star football team. And after he retired football, and this is just a long story about that, but we'll get those narratives out there because it's a good story. In 1928, he actually got his law degree. So after he retired from football, he became an assistant, assistant district attorney, and then he's the second elected judge in Chicago. That is an important part of our narrative. We got to get those stories out there so that this is second nature. But the picture in the Defender Archives, it wrote, on the back it was written, Judge Duke Slater and Joe Lewis. So I put that on Google Arts and Culture. That's it, those two. So one of my friends called me, who's 60, and he said, why don't you credit the other guy? Now, you, as people of a certain age know who that is, right? You know who that is. I didn't know who that was. And it wasn't written on the back. 
because you know my love of sports, but I won't bury the lead too much longer. That's Jackie Robinson. <laughs> now, I only know one image of Jackie Robinson. It's the one that's on the trading card when he was 24. And so my friend said, I'm gonna need you to write Jackie Robinson's name up there. And I said, but it doesn't say Jackie Robinson on the back, and that's not how you're supposed to do it. You're supposed to record the history that is accurate. And he said, you know, Ange, anybody with a pulse of a certain age wouldn't have thought to need to write Jackie Robinson's name. So I will tell younger people, it's like if you had 100 pictures of LeBron James, you wouldn't feel the need to make sure you wrote his name on every page. But fast forward 50 years later, some child that has not been born yet is gonna go, wasn't no name on there. <laughs> so we threw that out. So I asked five other people who were over 60, do you know who this is? And they were looking at me like, well, is this a, cause you know who that is, right? And I was like, well, I'm just trying to see if you know, you know, before we actually put Jackie Robinson's name on there. But the, the other beauty about this photograph is these were three captains of sports, boxing, football, and baseball, and they were actually playing golf because Joe Lewis made serious inroads into Pro-Am and the PGA. And so this, for black people who know sports better than I, but you know, I know football. <laughs> the, these, these kinds of stories and these pictures, they knew they were taking an iconic photo. And we've got to make sure that not only do we get the photo, but we've got to get the elders involved to make sure we get the good intel on there. Because I know everything else really well, except sports. But we also have added more than just photojournalism in history. We've got uh, fashion and beauty photographer Ernest Collins loaned us 120 images that we put up for Black History Month this year. So on our Google Arts and Culture page, we've added a lot of fashion and beauty specifically because that's part of our history. The key part of that is we also want to alter the metadata. So when you go and Google black man in Chicago, primarily what's being populated are news outlets and crime. So you, don't, you only get images from 1940, if you're lucky, but you mainly get crime. So it's important that as the Obsidian uploads all of this metadata onto the internet, when you type in black man, black woman, all this, we're gonna be populating it with a, hundreds of thousands of images that are not the collisions, because that's already been done. So we're picking the, the real intricacies of the culture, the layers to this game. So let's get back to reclaiming the Chicago narrative. And let's talk about Bronzeville. I'm gonna go over what uh, a lot of people know, maybe others don't, but this is one of my favorite photos. So we don't own this one. This was actually owned by the Library of Congress and it's completely royalty free. It was shot in 1940, about 1941. And most of us, this is the go-to photograph for Bronzeville. But this was, this was just a photographer coming to hear another narrative about how Bronze, Bronzeville was, but he just stopped five ordinary boys who were on their way to Sunday school and said, take a picture in front of this car. Because that's what Bronzeville looked like if we're writing the story. This is just another day in the life. Everybody dressed like that. All of the images from my childhood, that's what they looked like. So Bronzeville was called the Black Belt, but there was also a restricted covenant. So as we were moving in droves from about 1916 forward, 1916 and 1948, it was a law on the books that black people could only live in a specific area. And that was to call the restricted covenant. So we all piled into Bronzeville. It's not the Bronzeville proper today. It's about seven of those neighborhoods. And it's a big part of the South Side. So with the Black Belt, somehow we had three hospitals, six newspapers, 1,000 small black-owned businesses, 2,000 people worked in the numbers game, and we were three times densely, more densely populated than the rest of Chicago. So if you picked a, a, a certain series of blocks in North Side, there'd be 20,000 people. That same square footage in Bronzeville, 60,000. So we were piled in. But it wasn't what the narrative kind of, what the narrative I've been reading kind of leads us to. 
it was vibrant. So we had the Jones department store, we had the Palm Tavern, we went to the theaters, we had clubs. Bronzeville was really extremely exciting, populated, and vibrant. I'm stunned at this current narrative that kind of implies, again, just collisions of, I don't know, they came here and gosh, we gotta help them. And it's like, wait, you, you, you're leaving something out. So we've got to get that online so you guys can go to it as quickly as what I love about the youth culture is somebody puts out a fact, you guys clap back so fast with you know, all kind of facts and links and hyperlinks. It's like boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and so we've got to get this information digitized so that you can clap back against these negative stories. I don't know if it's that they are black adjacent or if it's malicious. I don't know, but the truth will set us all free. And easy, quick access to the truth will get us there. So I'll leave, it to, I'll leave the clap back to you guys because I can't text that fast, but <laughs> we'll get the information out there so that you can have access to it. But I was trying to figure out how did we do all of that without all of this help that has become the new narrative? Like, oh my goodness, if we don't help them by you know, eliminating their entire culture, then they won't be helped. So what we also did was form what we call the elder circle. And we started talking to people from Bronzeville. We have started interviewing and filming them and talking to them, getting the nuances of what's happening in uh, Chicago and what happened back in those days. Now, the guy in the corner is not uh, of that same generation, his Nathan Thompson, who wrote a book called The Policy Kings. And actually, we'll be doing a documentary, we'll be doing film. There's a lot that will be going on that we'll be explaining why Bronzeville was vibrant. And it was mainly because of the number runners. Now, I'll say this, the, uh, and because I, I don't want to give that story away because that's coming, but essentially those were the guys who played, who, who ran the numbers, which is like the lottery. I think it's important when I'm telling the story, I'm starting a narrative of 1746, the New York General Assembly had a lottery and they built King's College, which went on to become Columbia University. So when somebody else is telling the story, a lottery is acceptable. But, and then when we did lottery, it became you know, thuggery and illegal and illicit and all of those things. That's why it's important to drive your own narratives. But the policy kings lived in the community and they actually invested in the community. And if you wanted to open up a small business, you would get a small business loan from a policy king. So that's how we were able to be vibrant and self-sufficient. So, I want to make sure that we get that information to you guys. So that's kind of the overview of what the Obsidian Collection is and why we're doing it and what it is. So to take that forward, I am going to invite my colleague, my young colleague, uh, who has been amazing and bold in that she's one of the co-founders of the tribe, and they're a digital platform that speaks to millennials. I'll say this, when I saw it, I was like, I don't know who some of these people are. My son was like, oh, I know who all these people are. And he immediately joined the tribe. I've joined it too, but I'm gonna bring Morgan up to the stage. So let's give Morgan a hand. Thank you. Thank you. So first, I wanna ask you to tell everyone what is, uh oh, to tell everyone what is the tribe? Sure, so the tribe is a um, publication and production company with a mission to reshape the narrative of black Chicago. And we were born out of resistance to the dominant narrative of Chicago, which is that the dominant narrative of black Chicago, right. which is that we are a violent throwaway community and especially black millennials and youth that we are not invested in or that we don't care about black lives, which um, is, is a gross lie. So um, I did a crazy thing and I said, I can't take it anymore. I can't continue to, to watch the news 
and see black bodies on the ground. I can't continue to read the newspapers and see sensationalist headlines about what the body count was this weekend. And um, I called one of my best friends who I went to Northwestern with, and I said, what can we do? Um, she's a journalist, and uh, I talked to her, and I said, why don't you quit your job at your newspaper? <laughs> Move back to Chicago and write about what you care about. And that's what we did. Is that Tiffany? That's Tiffany, yeah. Because what I love about you guys' logo is it's, it's, it's forward, it's progressive, it's young, mm -hmm. and it's, I guess, the tribe. Why did you call it the tribe? We needed it to feel communal, and we wanted black Chicago to feel like this is ours. We are finally taking back our narrative. I want you to talk about, that's Tiffany, that's you in the middle, mm -hmm. And tell me who the other gentleman is. Um, that's David. He's our web developer and designer. So he's the one that came up with that logo. And it's funny because I actually pushed back with him on it. And then he said, I thought you wanted to do news different. And I was like, you know what? You're right. We're not going to look like your typical uh, mainstream media platform. This is going to look like a movement. We're going to brand it. It's going to be a lifestyle. Yeah. Well, that's great. One of the things, I, when I met Morgan, um, I was so moved by uh, the entrepreneurship. It reminds me of all of the entrepreneurship that I've learned in the archives and in the history. But one of the things I wanted to make sure everybody understood, one of the platforms you guys did was Shy Vote. Can you tell us about that? We're a small collective, really. There really is three of us. And so many people think that we're this huge conglomerate, but really we hire freelancers and we hire um, black voices to help tell these stories about black Chicago. But at our core, we thought there's no way that we're going to be able to take on the elections with all the five million candidates <laughs> that there are. So what can we do? So I said, why don't we reach out to other independent platforms and say, can we come together and amplify each other's stories so that we're not duplicating the same efforts and then create an election guide together. And that's what we did. So we reached out to the Better Government Association, Chicago Reporter, The Daily Line, Block Club Shy, um, Southside Weekly, a bunch of organizations to put together this nonpartisan election guide. So it's shy.vote. That's great. What, what do you think that the Obsidian the platform that we're building, which should launch later this year, how do you think that those tools can help what you guys are doing? Well, we have the same mission. It's all about reshaping the black narrative. Um, black youth are not being told the truth about who we are. It's not taught in schools. Um, there's no way for us to find some of this information really until we get to college. When we get to college, that may be the first time that we start reading texts by black authors. Mm -hmm. So um, when I think about the news and I think about 100 years from now, what are people going to go to to reference what black Chicago is right now? Can you really look at the archives of the Tribune or, or any, anywhere and say this is a full picture of what black Chicago is when the majority of that is going to be headlines about who was slain? So we see the tribe as someone and the Obsidian Collection as someone who can step in and say here is a more holistic, multifaceted view of who we are as a people. That's great. I think what I was hoping to make sure we accomplish is that people can get involved and follow the tribe and all of that. But tell me one of the fun stories or one of the important stories that you guys covered as the tribe that matter to you, that, that to, to stick out, because I know they all matter. Sure, sure. So we have a series on our site called Out West. Um, Tiffany, who's the co-founder of the tribe and the editor-in-chief, um, she's from North Lawndale. Um, it's <laughs> OK, <laughs> West Side. Um, but you know, everybody talks about the stories of the South Side because there's so many kind of vibrant middle class communities, but people just leave the west side out of the dialogue completely when it comes to West Chicago. <laughs> um, and so we wanted to focus on a series that talks about um, Tiffany's roots to the west side and also the great migration and that journey um, 
to the West Side and why um, the West Side is kind of like the city's forgotten stepchild. <laughs> so we actually journeyed to Mississippi together. Uh, we found out, Tiffany and I, that our families are both from Bolivar County. And so we went there to kind of discover the past. And um, it's a very fascinating story. If you look at the series about us as young people discovering who we are by retrace, retracing the, the roots of our grandmothers. So. so you use a lot of things more than just text. You use videos and you create documentaries. Oh, oh absolutely. So my background is that I'm a filmmaker. And so it's, while Tiffany is your more traditional journalist, I'm coming in like, no, we're not doing this the regular news way. I don't care about the 24-hour news cycle and what's trending on Twitter. Let's do more long-form stories that are going to matter um, later on. You know, So I use my documentary film background to tell um, um, like to make to create documentary series, multimedia stories because um, in this day and age, not everyone's going to read the text, but you need something that's going to go on social media, grab their attention. So we like to use audio, video, all different types of mediums to tell stories. Wow. Okay. Well, I think we've covered everything that we wanted to talk about today, and we can open it up to questions if anybody has any. As I sit here and listen to you guys both present, I'm filled with goosebumps in terms of the power of both of your platforms to tell new stories for our African-American experience. So I want to thank you guys for this presentation and just really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How have sponsors responded to your site? Um, actually, very well. We, I sell the tribe, I keep it real with people when I'm selling the tribe. Nobody's gonna tell stories about black Chicago like we can until they start hiring black people. So that hasn't happened. So we're gonna be your best voice for telling <laughs> stories about black people. <laughs> yeah, so they really come to us because they wanna reach our audience. Like you wanna get, um, I mean, black millennials are coming into like buying power. Everybody's interested in that. So yeah, people really approach us. Along those lines, how can we best support you, both of you and your organizations? You go first. <laughs> money, money is always <laughs> the answer. <laughs> I wish there was another answer I could give you, um, but we have the creativity, we have the, the education, we have a conglomerate of creatives who are ready and can't get hired at legacy papers. So yeah, if we have money, <laughs> we, can, we can tell more stories, and that is the best way to help us out. We can talk afterwards if you're interested. Oh my gosh, I love her, because I, I, I want to say uh, ditto to that, but um, gosh, I just love these young people, because that's it. I, I, I think my generation would have said the exact same thing in, in so many more words. I would have stretched that out to about seven or eight sentences. but. Um, <laughs> You know, with my formal education and all that, but I think that's that's what we're going to be reaching out for that as well. Hi, thanks so much for being here. Um, what kind of conversations are happening with teachers and with like the CPS system to kind of help um, with these gaps in the narrative that you're talking about? Because it's obviously such a crucial piece of this. Well, I appreciate you asking that because uh, both of my parents were teachers, and I so I I know way more about teaching in football, but I, one of the things that we are doing at the Obsidian is we're going to be uh, creating educational content as well. But the interesting thing about education right now is it has gotten very narrow, right? That people are teaching to uh, very standardized uh, systems, and, and it, it doesn't leave a lot of room for extra curricula that way. But the charter school system is coming up, and, and, and even they I've already been talking to them. There's, it's, it's just a very narrow space, but we're working with uh, virtual reality and, and some of all these other things so that when that relaxes a little bit, because I'm excited that, that places like Google and, and these big tech firms are moving away from these traditional narrow requirements, and that's allowing for a lot more creativity. We feel like with these platforms we can get the knowledge and information out, even if it doesn't come through 
organized curriculum systems. So we're just gonna keep creating, and then you young people just keep inventing. Just when I figured out this tool, now everything is on the virtual. So we're gonna get it there, and, and then we'll get the information out there, because you guys are taking in information so many different ways. Yeah. Let me add on to that, because I love talking to teachers about education. I think we need to totally reframe the way that we teach about history. Um, and I always tell this story. I remember being in about seventh or eighth grade, and my social studies teacher wrote on the board in huge letters, manifest destiny. And we're literally talking about the US going through and stealing everybody's land and just massacring people. And we call that section in history manifest destiny. So I need for teachers to start teaching from the point of view of the oppressed. And if the title of the text in history sounds like a comic book, then it's probably wrong. And we need to like reassess <laughs> yeah. what, what we're teaching our kids. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, first of all, I want to say that um, from my perspective, you nailed it on football. What's the problem? <laughs> right. That's what I see. Right. Um, but Collision. seriously, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, I'm Maud Lenny Hedrick, I'm both a columnist for the Sun Times and president of the National Association of Black Journalists. And I just want to say that, you know, um, more of a comment than a, a small question, and, and that is that. Um, I'm blown away. I'm blown away. Um, you know, I've, I've heard about your project. I've, I've read bits and pieces. But today, just sitting there, in the, in the few minutes that you went over some of the photos, you told me stories I didn't even know. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and, and yeah, I think I know everything. <laughs> you know, but, but I'm saying, you know, as black journalists and as veterans, we think we pretty much know the history. But there were pieces of that history you told me, I, just little small photos. Um, the one about the uh, guy who, Fred, is it Fred? Yes. Fred oh Hutchinson. my God, I've yes. never heard of him. Yeah. I was like, oh my, I made a note, go look him up. And his you know? grandson turned those archives over to Shorefront Legacy. His grandson still lives in Evanston. And that turned is amazing. That over. Yeah. That's amazing. And then um, just to say, you know, Morgan, of course. Hey, Morgan. I am <laughs> so, so proud of Morgan. And, and she and Tiffany and her team, um, you know, they just are, they're stars. They're NABJ stars here in Chicago. Um, the one thing I wanted to ask you is, so as I sat here listening to it, I was struck by how do I, I mean, besides telling the story of the Obsidian uh, Collective, how do we share those photos? I mean, uh, in terms of when you think about copyright and like if, if the Sun-Times, if I wanted to do a story on with a gallery of these photos, how are they being allowed to so be I'm, shared? I'm, I'm glad you asked that too. So we, we've got lawyers. Okay. Right, okay. But, um, and, uh, and, and so I've learned a lot about copyright law, but the, a big part of the Obsidian Collection platform, we're building a, a very expensive website, uh, yeah, uh, this is that is um, going to be a quick access to licensing and permissions okay. so that it's going to rival kind of the other stock photo images out there, as okay. well as a platform for viewing and pleasure and enjoyment. Okay. But there will be quick access, and that is a revenue share model so that the owners retain ownership and then can monetize. What it does is it allows revenue to go into these small archive groups that need right. those dollars. Okay. And then it makes it uh, available for you to tell the stories because okay. Uh, the Schomburg Library, which gathered all of the Harlem information, the reason Harlem is written more about than Bronzeville was is because you had access to the information. The Schomburgs actually gathered up all the images, and then you could go in there and license it and tell all these stories. Right. That hasn't been nearly as easy in Bronzeville. I, uh, I do the licensing and permissions for the Chicago Defender right now, and we, we've negotiated with movies, documentaries, books, but it's very manual, it's voluntary, and it is not, the, uh, it is not scalable. So we're, we're making that, uh, as a revenue stream for black legacy newspapers that own their archives, the photographers, and the archive groups. Okay, good. 
Hi, thank you ladies so much for your information. Um, it's gonna be beneficial to all. So um, my uh, comment slash question is in the form of money, since you mentioned that. And so my question is, have either of you uh, thought about any type of fundraising efforts uh, in order to not only get uh, your information out there, but then also collect funds at the same time? Right, the tribe is actually celebrating our second anniversary right now. So we'll be having a huge fundraiser on April 12th. So yeah, you'll be getting all of that information. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, and we don't have a fundraiser schedule, but we will. It's, it's gonna be as, as new collections join the Obsidian, our hope is to, as we welcome them, to have a fundraiser to celebrate, because the, the digitization takes time, treasure, money, all of those things, so we'll, that, that's our strategy. Thank you. I was gonna ask you, you know, uh, we, you're here in Chicago, so the Chicago Defender is available, but what about the other black newspapers across the country? How urgent, what's, to, and, and can you give us an example of what it's like going into the bowels of whatever to find this material? And is some of it destroyed? Is it salvageable at the other newspapers, say in Lincoln, Pennsylvania, or uh, you know, Amsterdam News in New York? Yeah, so it's, it's, that's, a, that's a phenomenal question. When, when we started with the Defender, the first thing I did was start talking to other black legacy papers just to kind of see where they were so we could mirror what they were doing, and, uh, and nobody was doing it. As you know, as journalism uh, institutions have shrunk, the first thing you kind of put on the side is the archive and you maintain the journalism. So, um, and then when things are sold, different people have them, different people feel they own them. So we've got the lawyers sorting all of that out, but we've got a lot of, we've got like eight legacy newspapers in the queue that want to join the Obsidian. But most philanthropy is local. So in terms of rolling them in and getting them digitized, those are very um, specific to the local community aspects. And we're looking at partnering with local HBCUs to partner with their library science departments and get some of that labor going and get this whole thing kind of this big obsidian circle, which is the logo, obsidian circle. I can add on to that a little oh, bit sure. about archiving. Um, again, we do see the tribe um, as a future um, source for these types of materials because so many newspapers um, and publications have laid off photographers right. and, and people who take videos and things like that. And, and a lot of millennials and youth, we get our news from our phones mm -hmm. um, and from really kind of like tabloid sites on, on Instagram and, and Twitter, like the Shade Room and things like that, where it's not real news mm -hmm. and it's people just aggregating materials. So it's very important for us to be very um, persistent in going out and taking new images and capturing uh, what Chicago is today. That's one thing I, I, I love about you guys is you're not just aggregating entertainment and, and just yeah, kind of recirculating. We actually make a point not, we don't aggregate at all. Like yeah. we don't go and say, oh, this is trending right now. We're gonna just like copy and paste what, this pe what these people said because our whole thing is since we have a small staff is like, if this story is already being told, there's no reason for us to like, tell it to, yeah, yeah. you know? We need to go in and tell the stories that are not being told. That, that's a great point. <clears throat> With this being Black History Month, and I think it's important, like you said, you need to tell the stories that are not being told. Uh, my name is Crystal Allison, and I, I tell people I'm first generation great migration uh, to Chicago by way of Arkansas and Tennessee. And in that process, I've been, Angela and I have known each other since high school, and we've talked a lot I about look this. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked a great deal about this, and I shared, and I think that what is, you know, what she's doing is phenomenal, and I just learned about the tribe today. Angela may have mis mentioned it in none of some of our other conversations, but uh, when the movie The Butler came out, and I was at the advanced screening, and it was done by, um, what's his name? Um, Lee Daniels. So they're talking about it because they didn't know about that story. So I was there for the Q&A, et cetera. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The black man that was in the White House, he was the highest level executive in the White House at that time, who happened to be one of my relatives, Everett Frederick Morrow. 
he had under the Eisenhower administration, he was the first African American to have the highest level position in the White House. When Obama ran for president, then they talked about it here and there. And by eBay, because I like to look stuff up as well, I realized that he had written a book and it was entitled Black Men in the White House. And he chronicled a lot of the things that were going on and a lot of the involvement that he had. So as I spoke to Lee Daniels, I was kind of like, in telling that story, you also need to tell this story too, because he was a Republican and he was a lawyer. And in addition, his sister also made some major inroads as well. But it was kind of like, I'm learning like, I didn't know this. You know, as well as I'm learning a lot of other things. I didn't know one of my great uncles was a Tuskegee Airman. He's going to be 99 years old this year. So I think that what you guys are doing on both sides, on the millennial side and on this side, that there are stories to be told. There are photographs that are out there that are in people's personal collections. And so I'm not sure if I missed part of it, but what are you doing to get personal collections included in your archives as well? Well, or, or how do you communicating that this exists so that people, you know, because some people, as they're leaving us, you know, the photographs, you know, are being buried, thrown away, or kind of locked in somebody's uh, photo book and not being told about? Well, one of the things uh, that, that a personal archive collection actually kind of falls under the category for us. As a, as a small community archive. So when the Obsidian first joined Google Arts and Culture, we put out uh, a press release and we got a ton of pickup because everybody was just right. so excited about that. And uh, one of the phone calls I got was uh, a woman who had inherited her dad's collection of 300,000 photos that included 1960s Motown, which is gold, and 1960s Chicago, which was awesome too. And so many times people inherit these wonderful collections of black legacy, but they definitely want to retain ownership. And most people think, well, I've got to stand up a museum, I've got to create my own foundation, I've got to replicate right. this entire thing. And what we're offering instead is a platform for some of that, but at the same time, we're going to be uh, having workshops and symposiums on how to properly store and keep your own archives. And also what's valuable, what's, what's valuable to the world and what's valuable to you, which may be two different things. You know, um, what, what happens when people leave things with a, uh, a collection? What happens when people leave them with a museum or a university? So we're going to do a lot of education around protecting black history as well. So our goal isn't to build another black Smithsonian, even though that place is amazing, we're going to be doing, we're focusing more on digital uh, outreach, even though we will have a, a location. I mean, I think that there is, you know, there's another museum that's in the process of being built. I forget where it's going to be built at. Uh, well, there's always right. museums. So there's, I mean, we're not, we're not right. so there's always cornering mark, that space. Right, exactly. Yeah. So there's always room for, I think, for additional stuff, because just as that museum, has a lot of wonderful stuff in there. As I was told, they couldn't get everything in there. So there's, you know, again, more stories that are out there to be told as well. So it's good to see that there are both platforms or forums here to provide that as a mechanism for learning more because I think it is important that we're taught who we are and uh, learn more about ourselves. Thank, thank you. you. I just thank y'all very much okay. for coming. And I wanted to ask you guys, like, y'all really inspired me here today, like, listening to this a lot, and it was really interesting. I'm wondering, um, is fine art ever going to be part of that? Like, you know, like, because this, I, you know, I'm 50, so I'm, like, in between, uh, you know, the millennium or whatever, but I have seen, I had my first piece in the museum when I was 10, so I've seen. You said fine arts? Yeah. Um, like, so, what about, like, Richard Hunt and Kerry Just Marshall and all those people? Like, they did some really cool, interesting shit back in the day. On the tribe, um, we recognize that um, news isn't the only way to capture our story. So uh -huh. we have a section on the site. If you go to the top, there's a tab that says the works, and it's just a space for creative works of 
many different mediums from like short films to photography, art. Um, so yeah, okay. so we open that up for people to submit that type, that type of material to cool. us. Okay, thank you. That's good to know. I'll check you guys out. Thank yeah, and, and so we haven't been able to get into the fine arts space yet because that's a different set of legal questions. And, yeah. And, and yeah. so right now we've got images and who owns the image, but projecting art isn't something we've gotten to yet. Yeah, it was, it's some really It's some beautiful artists. things out yeah. there. I agree yeah. with you like on all that. All over Chicago, all of stuff. Yeah. Too. Yep. Yeah. All right, thank you. Again, if you can give uh, Morgan and Angela uh, one more round of applause.